All right, welcome. Uh, welcome to the Wednesday Hump Day Hangout, first Wednesday of the month. Uh, this time uh, on the first Wednesday of the month, we feature all about training. Um, I'm Tony Carroll with the International Society of Fire Service Instructors, and uh, we also have uh, a recurring recurring member of the group here, Chief Shaw from 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 Florida down there. Just uh, recently got promoted, so we're blessed to have him um, come on on board with us here and talk a little bit about training. In addition to uh, the two of us that are kind of uh, familiar faces for you guys that tune in here, we also have three members of an ISFSI committee who help put together some stuff we're going to talk about today. So, um, you know, this month we don't have the traditions guys. Uh, they're going to let us kind of talk about the ISFSI stuff. So uh, we'll, we'll get into it. Uh, this, we're talking mentoring, mentoring. I'm really not familiar with mentoring. Um, I have a uh, department doesn't really have a program like that. You know, we do have, um, uh, obviously we have new recruits who come in, they get assigned to a, to a recruit class. Perhaps they'll find someone there that they can, they can um, learn about the department from. Um, I had, had, I do remember some horror stories about people kind of coming on and they would teach them how to sharpshoot, right. How to, how to negotiate some of those things in the fire department that maybe um, help them get one over or something. So that's, it's kind of what I can kind of relate to as far as, um, having someone help you through. Um, so, you know, not a good thing. I, I, it's, it's, it's never really been um, an idea that we need to have mentors, but I can definitely see where, where, we, where we need them. As I've gone through my, my time and I see that it's so important that we have some of these soft skills in addition to the technical and, and uh, you know, tactical and things like that, um, that it's probably that we get, we get people involved and have them meet other people that can kind of that are successful in the job and maybe help them get through and show them how to negotiate some of the trials and difficulties maybe with the job. So with that, I know uh, uh, Chief Shaw, Chief Shaw, have you guys had any um, any experience there really with mentoring? So I'm really glad we're, we're discussing this today. I think that uh, this is my uh, this 26th year in the fire service total. And I remember early on hearing the concept of mentoring and it was always kind of an informal thing. Like when somebody mentioned that somebody was their mentor, it was kind of something that happened informally, it just happened along the way. These days, I hear the concept of, of mentoring much more organized, much more structured, much more um, intentional in nature, whether it's in the fire departments, whether it's in the business world, whether it's an educational uh, system, I hear that concept a lot more. I see dedicated programs for mentorship, and it's nice to see that people are being intentional about it. So first things first, I'll say there's a need for it. And if you think about the need, so right now, and going back, let's say 20, 30 years ago, what we're doing then as opposed to what we are doing now, what's expected of us now is ridiculously more than it's ever has been. So this concept of mentoring, this concept of one-on-one, -on -one, this concept of really honing in on each of our individuals and finding a way to maximize what we're doing and what we are capable of doing is necessary because of everything that we're responsible for. Um, I've got a couple of notes here that one of my, um, my, my chiefs sent me just a, a day ago. This is pretty interesting. So this is from the Professional Standards Bureau. 90% uh, of the investigations done are directly related to core leadership theories, practices, or a lack of expectations set forth by officers. That's a, that's a profound statement that most of them are, let's say, navigable. Um, another thing, and this is something your departments are probably dealing with as well, for our department in Fort Lauderdale, right now, a quarter of our department is over 21 years, so in some cases, 30 years of experience and service in the job. In other words, they can all retire tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So in terms of this mentorship, not only is there a need, there's a tremendous opportunity in a lot of our organizations. Um, so I'm definitely happy to, to talk about this today. I'm definitely happy to hear about what the ISFSI is doing. I, I can tell you, internally, it's a mix. Uh, it seems like what we're doing here in Fort Lauderdale is kind of the same that's being done around the area. Uh, we have a little bit of an informal mix with a uh, formal. Uh, in the informal side, uh, when I was EMS chief last year, I would um, have monthly meetings with the, the lieutenants on the rescue trucks, the medical rescue trucks, and we'd have these uh, meetings where we go over uh, what was going on, the concerns, how I can assist them, how I can uh, manage some of their, their difficulties, and we're still working on that. So it was more informal in nature. On a more formal side, in our protocols, if there's an abundance of people on duty for a day, let's say in captains or lieutenants, the first spot they go, can go to 
is a spot right next to either a battalion chief or as a second on an engine where they're getting that experience working with another officer. Now, it's kind of sporadic because based on staffing, that'll determine if that, that it's there. But at least there's something in place. You know, so at least we're starting to take the right directions for this. This year is the first year that we'll be implementing a one-on-one -on -one mentorship program with our new hires coming on board. So that's an exciting thing, too. That not only are you getting that initial experience over 12 weeks, but they're going to be assigned one member from our agency to have that one-on-one -on -one experience and that back and forth, that mentoring going forward. So really forward, looking forward to seeing what kind of effect that has. But um, so that's my experience with mentoring. Um, I get, I'm telling you, I'm glad we're having this discussion because this is more needed now than it ever has been before. So do you think, I mean, I, I, you always seem, I mean, I, I, when you see the word mentor, right, you think official, formal mentoring, um, assigning someone to somebody else. Um, do you think, I mean, is this really a, a good way for us to replace or to fix maybe that brain drain that, that like you talk about with retirement? I mean, you said a quarter of your department can leave, right? Um, which, I mean, I, I can leave and I'm, I'm really looking for some place, some reason to leave. Anyways, you say a quarter of your people can leave. So that's a big gap, right? That's a lot of, a lot of institutional knowledge that, um, you know, as much as we, as much as we forget, you know, we, we didn't do it that way. We don't do it that way now. That really helps with how we're going to do it in the future, right? So is this, is this, you think mentoring is that way? Is that replacement maybe that will help to get rid, to, to avoid the brain drain? Are you asking me, Tony? So I will say that it's not, it's not only uh, an option. It's not only a replacement. It is absolutely necessary. It is something that needs to be considered by fire rescue departments across the country because of the reasons we just discussed. It's not, it's almost not even an option anymore. You got so much on the plate for every fire rescue department around the country that is different than it's been 20, 25, 30 years ago. You have to think of new creative ways to make sure you're maximizing that, the content uh, that, that they're, they're able to absorb and digest and the way they're able to perform in the field. And you can't let all that experience, all those people that have been around for almost a generation go without passing on that knowledge. So it's not even an option, to, to be quite frank. We need to be intentionally thinking about how to really navigate through mentoring in our service. Now, so um, I'm glad you, you talked about passing on knowledge, because now we have Chief Halton here to pass on uh, knowledge. Um, he's a great, right? He always is a good part on our, on our shows and stuff to kind of be that um, emeritus um, knowledge guy that can kind of in, insert some stuff to us. So Chief, Chief Halton, thanks for, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate you uh, joining us. Sorry for the delay, guys. I got quite the quite the day. <laughs> well, well um, hopefully we can uh, bring some normalcy to it. We got some some new guys joining us today. We got Jesse Marcotte. We got Damon Simmons and Jacob McAfee. Jesse, Jesse, uh, thanks a lot for coming on. You want to tell us a little bit about you? Absolutely. Uh, first and foremost, thank you to yourself and to Fire Engineering for inviting us on today's uh, Hum Day Hangout. This is a new initiative that we're incredibly excited to talk about. And I think it's something, as, as Chief Shaw alluded to, it's something that can fill a lot of gaps within our organizations, whether it's generationally or um, as, as people are moving up in the organization or being uh, welcomed to the organization from a new hire perspective. So thank you for having us on. This is something that we're definitely very passionate about. A little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Jesse Marcotte. I work in the Metro Detroit area for department, um, the Northville Township Fire Department. So we are basically uh, just about 15 miles west of the city of Detroit. I've been here for uh, almost 19 years this year, 20 years in the fire service total. And I've had the, uh, the opportunity of serving with Demond and Jacob and, and a few other uh, members that aren't able to attend today's hump day hangout. But uh, really over the last year and some change, I've been riding their coattails and learning a lot about mentoring. And uh, collaboratively, we've been working on the solution in a way that, that provides really a unique um, twist on mentoring and fills what we believe to be a really big need, um, you know, in the fire service in general. And a lot of these skills are things, and you touched on it, um, specifically when you said soft skills, these are things that can help us not only professionally, but also personally. So um, that's my background, training coordinator here um, at our organization. And I'll, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Demond to introduce himself. 
Um, good afternoon, good morning, gentlemen. Damon Simmons, Special Operations Chief, Oakland Fire. Um, year 24, one year shy of the halfway mark. I'll say that again, one year short of the halfway mark of 50 years, that's the goal. But I'm excited to be here today to talk about this important topic of mentoring and coaching. Um, one of the things I enjoy about these webcasts is that they are somewhat semi-scripted and oftentimes they're unscripted um, and just picking up off some of the conversation that's been uh, generated so far, uh, the why of this mentoring and coaching program. The men and women coming into the fire service today, they are much smarter than the men and women who came in from yesteryears. And that's not an indictment on individuals from um, who, who came before us. It's just as society evolves, that's typically how it plays out. So therefore, the individuals, the men and women, these young men and women who are coming in today, we need to provide them with them the right, with the right skill set, knowledge, skills, and abilities so that they can be successful. Unfortunately, what happens in a lot of fire service organizations all across the United States is that we plant good seeds in bad soil. These young men and women, they come in, they're eager to learn, they're, they're excited, they want to serve their respective communities, and we put them in these fire stations, and not all fire stations. So before you go back to the firehouse, the coffee table would beat me up. Understand this is not 100% true across the board. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, that's what's going on. And we just can't have that. And looking at it from the end goal, it's our responsibilities to set these young men and women up for success because they will be the next men and women who will be leading the fire service. As a good friend of mine in the Oakland Fire Department, Chris Robinson says, we, have, we only have so many runs in us. Someday we're gonna have to pull the plug and it's gonna be over. And this last comment before I turn it back over, really emphasizing the why on mentoring and coaching. Tony, you and I were discussing a little earlier, you know, you work in Washington, DC, I work in Oakland. You know, you take your downtown area. If you put a price tag on the downtown area in Washington, DC, no different than here in Oakland, um, you're putting company officers in charge of assets exceeding over a billion dollars. And that's billion with a B. A response district, the structures, the men and women at that fire station, the fire station itself, the apparatus, and to provide these individuals with a bugle or two bugles and not provide them with continuous guidance and engage professional development we're setting them up for success. All the more reason why I'm excited about this mentoring and coaching program that Jesse and a few others have been, um, have been so passionate about launching here uh, through the uh, society. And it's gonna be great. It's gonna be great. And this is, our this is our continued contribution to the next generation of men and women who are gonna lead here in the American Fire Service. That's that's good. Thank you, Demond. Jacob, Jacob McAfee, we have you uh, in your car. You said you're yeah. on your way to the firehouse. Yeah, I was on my way. I couldn't make it. I got held up, so I apologize for that. So uh, I don't have a nice office to sit in right now. So, but I appreciate it. Hey, just a little bit. Uh, first of all, it's hard to follow up uh, what Demond said, but I think he hit it on the head, and what Jesse and Chief Shaw were talking about. Ultimately, our job is to leave it better than we found it. Right. And not only leave it better than we found it from an organizational perspective, but from a fire service perspective. And if we're going to do that, we have to do that individually as well, right? We have to prepare the people that are going to take our job to do a better job than we did. And I think um, with a, a solid, well, really informally and a solid formal mentoring program, we can prepare them for the, you know, the emotional, intelligent, soft skills, whatever you want to call them, ability to actually navigate the waters of the firehouse, the political environment you know, uh, those type of things that, that we typically don't focus on, you know, in the, in the fire service, along with, of course, you know, the fire ground strategy tactic stuff. Um, so a little bit about me real quick. I, you know, 22 years in the fire service. Uh, I know Jesse and Damon and everybody on here. Um, I, I've, from the, from an informal process through this, I've learned a ton and um, uh, yeah, I consider them mentors uh, for myself as well. Uh, I currently work in the Fresno, California area. So not too far uh, from Demond actually. Um, work for a, a special fire district, North Central Fire Protection District, worked there about three years. The rest of my career uh, has either been um, Department of Defense, a uh, civilian firefighter, uh, worked in a few different states, worked on the East Coast and the West Coast, uh, did 18 years with the DOD in California, Arizona, and New Jersey, 
And so I think one, one common theme throughout that is the need for mentoring and getting into an organization and providing that, you know, one-on-one -on -one direct support to pass on that institutional knowledge to help people navigate the firehouse uh, and the fire ground is absolutely critical. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be here to talk about what the ISFSI has done today. So uh, let me, I, I worry, I was in the, I was in the training academy for a while, right? And we can, we can really screw a recruit up by putting him in a bad assignment, right? And we can make, we can set them up for a great career if we put them in the, the, the a good assignment, right? So how do we, how do we ensure that uh, we're putting somebody with the right mentor, right? I mean, we're going to have to train the mentors too, right? I mean, it's, how do we make sure that they can, they can do the job as the mentor? So I, I can take this one if you guys would like. Um, one of the things that's really unique about the ISFSI mentoring and coaching initiative is we're actually using a third party software to facilitate this entire initiative. So, um, you know, in the past, if, if we were, were to try to launch something similar, it may seem fragmented or sporadic. And we're really just trying to maybe just connect people um, through email chains or, or some other uh, mechanism. But really what we're doing with this is we are identifying um, people who could serve as mentors for a variety of roles. So, and that's why, you know, mentoring itself has been around for hundreds of years, right? Through an informal um, type setting. And now in, in modern times, a much more formal setting, especially in the private sector. And that's where a lot of the information that we get from mentoring really comes from, the facts, the information, some of that why as well. And um, when, we're, when we're relating that back to the fire service, we're trying to connect people, not just within your organization. As the ISFSI, we're trying to connect members from you know, the Netherlands to Alaska and everywhere in between. So this third-party software allows us to build our mentor base for coaching and for mentoring. So it might be a single session, simple type of thing where um, somebody is, is looking to get published in uh, one of the fire service trade journals, such as fire engineering, but that can seem daunting from the beginning. So from a coaching perspective, we can match them with somebody who has experience in that field. They can, um, they're basically paired through a survey that they fill out on the website. And then it facilitates that entire um, relationship using the software, the video conferencing, the chats, the sharing of documents, um, sharing of screens, all those sorts of things. And then from a mentoring perspective, um, you're 100% correct that there are expectations and there are also, there's a skill set needed to be a mentor, not just those hard skills in terms of the technical competence and expertise, but also soft skills in terms of your interpersonal skills, conflict resolution, emotional intelligence, all of those things play into that as well. So we, as the ISFSI are actually, uh, if you could think of it as a credential, if you will, so prospective mentors will receive training on, on, you know, kind of a mentoring 101 level. This is what mentoring is. These are the qualities of a good mentor. This is how those relationship works. And that will be that initial train the trainer where they're also then receiving the training on our platform as well, because we want people to have the confidence in using this uh, platform that we're going to use to facilitate this entire initiative. So uh, that is a, 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 a cornerstone of our program to make sure that the people serving as mentors and coaches are well-versed not only in their subject area, but also in what it means to be an effective coach and mentor within the framework of this formal program. And Tony, just kind of adding on to that, because obviously, you know, we are here promoting the um, mentoring and coaching program through the society. Uh, I'm a realist. Not everybody that's listening to this um, session or will listen to it at some point in time will go back to their respective organization and actually uh, uh, click into this particular program. So to answer your question, what organizations and individuals can do um, sans this particular program right here is to go back and have that conversation with all the men and women in that organization, emphasizing many of these things that we just mentioned about giving back to the fire service, setting it up, setting the next generation of men and women up for success and, ident and identifying those company and chief officers who have um, display good behaviors that are in line with what we want in the next generation of men and women in the fire service and start having those conversations. Start having those conversations at the coffee table, on the tailboard, 
And then when the men and women come into the fire service, they come to that recruit academy, rookie school, whatever you want to call it, set those individuals up with incumbent members and start building that relationship. But also after you set up that mentoring program, whether it's through the, um, the society or you do something in-house or informally, it's important that there is an oversight and evaluation and provide guidance and suggestions for how mentors and mentees can engage and interact with each other. Because what's happening in the fire service, we hear things such as mentoring mentioned a lot. We hear succession planning mentioned a lot. And there's probably one to 2% of fire, fire departments, at least in the United States that have a successful succession plan and mentoring plan in place. It sounds good, but the harsh reality is not taking place. So those are some of the things that I would suggest folks can do short of joining on into the society's mentoring and coaching program. Oh, good. So what, what is the difference between coaching and mentoring? This is a great one for Chief McAfee. Absolutely. No, I, I think, uh, you know, honestly, everybody can answer this, you know, great. And everybody have a different perspective on it, but, um, for me, coaching is a, um, a, a series of one-time events that is designed to improve someone's skill set in a certain thing. And, and I use this, like I said, I use this analogy a lot just because it's simple, but I always like to take a, a, a basketball player trying to improve free throws, right? Um, when he's trying to improve his free throws, he's working on that specific thing. I want to improve my free throws. So in that, he has to get his feet right. He has to rotate the ball right. Someone watches his you know, his wrist and his movements and his arc and all those things, but everything they're doing, they're coaching them to be better at free throws. For me, at least um, uh, from a mentoring perspective, mentoring is more holistic. So if, if you're paired or formally paired in this case with the ISFSI, for example, you're paired with a mentor, their job isn't just to help you, um, you know, understand uh, a skill-based thing on the fire ground, not to, you know, for a throw a ladder or perform a size up or, you know, run a simulation. That's not the only job that they have. It's a more holistic whole person approach. So it's identifying some of those things we talked about. We call them soft skills. You call them whatever you want, but help identify some of the things as an individual that they can navigate the firehouse better, resolve conflict in the firehouse better, you know, be a better, um, you know, uh, uh, ride the line between supervisor, manager, leader in the firehouse and really identify some of those emotional intelligence ideas or, or theories on, you know, how do you, how do you identify or uh, identify and self-regulate your emotions and your actions in certain situations, you know, to have a better outcome? How do you empathize with people uh, to understand different perspectives? Can you communicate well? You know, when I say communicate well, can you communicate to listen, both understanding where they're coming from, and then actually taking that in and responding in a way that they they take it. So I think when I say a whole person approach or a holistic approach, you're really working on all the tangible skills that we talk about daily in the fire service, but you're talking about how do I make this person navigate the waters of the firehouse better? Because at the end of the day, most of our problems aren't on the fire ground. Most of our problems are in the firehouse. You know, if we look across the fire service, and that's usually because we don't teach how to deal with people a lot. And I think from a holistic standpoint, mentoring, to me, helps bridge that gap between. Uh, uh, tactics or tools that you have throughout your career to communicate better, to get through to that person, to get by. And, you know, it's all those holistic approaches um, from a, a leadership or supervisor perspective. So um, I think mentoring is more holistic. Coaching is more specific for a, a task or a skill. Uh, one thing that I've heard recently, um, again, as we talk about soft skills and things like that, is that we, we killing, we're killing and injuring firefighters on the fire ground, but we're killing careers in the firehouse, right? So um, that may be a more, right? I, I, we, we, we do really good. We build, we, we spend the first six months or so teaching our guys the skills to, to, to do the job, right? But, but, but like you said, we don't really invest any time in navigating that difficult stuff in the firehouse um, or with people and, and, and things. So no, this is, this is good. Chief Halton, you have something? 
Well, <clears throat> I'm not uh, directly connected with the program, um, but I'm following the conversation. I've, I've seen the program um, explained to me before by some of the other uh, board members. I find it intriguing. I think that there's a, I think what's important about it is that life coaches are a very popular um, phenomena of our um, modern era, right? Everybody we know has someone who has a, a life coach, uh, whether they work with them through physical training or they work with them through spiritual training. Many of the churches you know, have life coaches that you can talk to. And I think that what we're looking at here is kind of um, uh, an iteration of that type of thing, but for the job, right? For specific to the fire service. And the context of our kind of work is radically different than most other folks's. So when you're looking at somebody like Goldman's work on uh, whether you know it's EI or, or SI, and, and he always argues that the social intelligent quotient is more important than, than the emotional intelligent quotient, which is definitely more important than folks IQ, because we all know a lot of really dumb, smart people. Um, there's a real big difference between smart and wise, right? Uh, you know, I, I know geniuses who, you know, can't tie their shoelaces, but they're bloody geniuses, right? Um, so it's our job, our work is more about, obviously, social intelligence and wisdom than it is about, you know, raw intellectual skill. And coaching in that, especially when you talk about um, mentoring in that, and, and, and I agree with uh, Chief McAfee's description, coaching is kind of where you get down to, it's, maybe it's a subset of mentoring, right? So there's times when as a mentor, you're gonna say, okay, let's go through this problem resolution thing, you know, in a couple of different settings to make sure we've got it, the flow down, right? That's the coaching aspect of being a mentor. I don't, I don't think you ever wanna, you know, and, and trust me, I get paid to mess around with words. So w words matter, but they're also somewhat malleable, right? And, and I, I don't like the fact that our modern society repurposes words for all kinds of crazy ways in order to fit, you know, agendas. And I'm not saying to do that, but I'm saying a good coach, a good mentor should be a fairly good coach. And there were a couple of interesting things here to think about and um, uh, that, that y'all were talking about. Um, tr smart and wise, we just talked about trained versus experienced, right? Like you can give someone a lot of training, even since coaching and counseling, say we give a, we mentor people, they're going to learn a lot more going through the first three or four times they go to use it. Cause we all have like the, the first time you've got your brand new bugles and it's time for, you know, you know, quarterly evaluation or, you know, whatever. And, and you sit down with your folks is a lot different than when you did it at the Academy, when you got trained in your officer's school, right? Simulation in the real world, are radically different things because now you've got a real human being in front of you. So I thought that was a great point. And, and I uh, also thought it was, it, was, it, was interesting, it was an interesting thought that I had in the back of my head. When it, the, the analogy that uh, Demond brought up, which I love, the parable you know, from Jesus about seed falls on the road and it gets stepped on and crushed. The other seed falls in with weeds and it gets choked out. Other seed you know, hits good soil and, and there comes the fruit, right? So it's a great parable that we take from, you know, the, the teachings of, of, of uh, from the New Testament. And, you know, it fits in all kinds of, all kinds of settings. People might be a little different than seeds sometimes, though. I, I think like when, when the, the good parable talks about almost like ideas and, and the new way of thinking about life versus the old law, which was very retributive and very strict. And the new law was more about how we treat one another. Interesting thing to think about. And I would love to hear you guys' thoughts on it, it kind of. The recruit, we talked about, oh, we don't want to put the recruit in with a, a bunch of weeds because those weeds might choke out that potential recruit, which is, which is a possibility. The other thing is sometimes you take some real hardcore characters, you know, who just, you know, we're just hard. And every now and then we get a hardcore crew, right? We get that crew that's, they're just tough nuts for whatever reason. They're angry all the time. It's, it's always raining when they come to work. I don't know, they, they never had a dog. I don't know. They're just those kinds of folks, right? Sometimes when you put in um, an opportunity, a young person that they can show their skills to, now they've got something to recognize their potential and their, and their worth and 
We all want to be recognized. We all want to have meaningful lives. So you could take that crew that was maybe feeling, you know, alienated for whatever reason. Everyone's got their, everyone's got their crosses to bear, their burdens. So, and they may have just been expressing it poorly, but sometimes, you know, we tend to ascribe motive or we tend to rate people by what we see on the outside. And sometimes we just got to take a chance, right? So I think that sometimes like that might be exactly the place you want to put a recruit to see, you know, and, and, and you'd probably have to be careful about it, but I just wondered what you guys thought about that. Cause when you said it, I was thinking, cause I've had to do, I've, I've been a training chief like you all. I've had to make, make assignments with, you know, go to my chief's office and say, okay, we're putting Simmons over here with Sean Carroll and those characters are pretty tough characters, you know, and I don't know how DeMond's going to do. And, you know, and sometimes the boss would look at you and say, you know, he's a sweet kid. I think he's going to do fine. I think, I think he might just be the right kind of thing that those characters are going to enjoy. You know what I mean? I don't know. I, it's, it's so wickedly complex when you're talking about people. Somebody once said this would be a great job if it wasn't for people. <laughs> but the great, I, I mean, the whole idea, right? That's like a great conversation when you're having with a young chief who comes to you about advice and, you know, and, and I'm running a training academy and how do I fit my, you know, sometimes be careful about what we project onto others as we see them. Because the, the envelope is sometimes, there's probably, sometimes the cover of the book doesn't really tell you what's between the pages or the potential or the potential, you know? So I don't know, sorry. <laughs> no, and Chief, that's great. Thing. Um, that's great wisdom on your part, and and I, you know, I agree. You know, those individuals that that crew of that station that's um, ostracized or, or alienated, they get their fresh blood coming in. That may be the, the the trigger to turn things around. Yeah, strong possibility. Just to jump, I just wanted to jump in real quick on something Chief Alton said real quick. I thought was interesting. Uh, I always like to talk about um, experiences versus experience. Uh, and I always like that, that old saying, do you have one year of experience? Uh, do you have 20 years of experience or do you have one year repeated 20 times? Right. And so, you know, when we talk about succession planning, I know we hit it for a little bit, but from a, from a mentoring aspect, um, that experiences part, I think, is a critical role for the mentor because you got to bridge the gap from, from class to reality. Uh, and then a good example is that, you know, a lot of time, you know, for example, one of my battalion chiefs, you know, they go to a fire officer three class, a fire officer core four class. And, you know, let's just say they talk about drafting mutual aid agreements or auto, auto aid agreements. Well, they talk about it in the vacuum of just drafting the agreement. They don't really put you in positions or talk about the political aspects to the agreement. They don't talk about the data and the research and everybody's perspectives on what's beneficial to each organization when you're discussing whether those agreements are good or not. And, and the example I have is uh, one, we took one of my battalion chiefs to one of our auto aid agreement negotiations. It was coming up for a renegotiation and, you know, a, a few different sides wanted one thing and we wanted the other. And it, half of it was political, at least half of it. Uh, and half of it was, uh, hey, we want to provide the best service to our communities because we share some of the communities. But in that discussion and how we navigated that, you, could, you couldn't just go to a fire officer three class, come back and say, hey, hey, chief, I want you to go negotiate this agreement because you, you never did any of the things that actually come up into play. And so for me, a mentoring from a mentoring standpoint, and, and I and I I'm apologize for trying to separate mentoring and coaching. Initially, I think they're absolutely intertwined. Um, but for me, the mentoring standpoint is that's that's where that bridges the gap between a supervisor saying, hey, we need to get you certified to this and and we need to get you, you know, competent in this. But what does that really look like? And the mentoring can help fill those gaps. Like, hey, when I when I get on this team, when I go to negotiate that agreement, what are the things I need to prepare for? You know, and, and you talk about those things, the political aspects, the data aspects, the perspectives, and you talk about how those negotiations go so they're a little more prepared and then put them in those positions. So, um, you know, I, I think the experiences versus experience, I think the mentoring can really help in that regard. I agree. And Chief Halton also touched on something that I'd like to, to jump into for a second as well in, in the concept of potential. And from the surface, it's easy to say that, or it may be easy to say that the benefits of mentoring are exclusive to the person being mentored. 
but what we know and what we've seen um, both internally in our organization as well as as just the world of formal mentoring in general is that a lot of the benefits also go back to the person who is serving as the mentor. And, and locally, back in our organization, we've been fortunate to have a formal one-to-one mentoring and coaching program in place for well over the last 10 years. And we've learned a lot from that. And, and what we've learned is oftentimes our best mentors are, are people who served as mentees. And then that, that experience as a mentee and that experience as a mentor, there's a lot of responsibility carried with that. And, and ultimately, at least for that first stretch of somebody's employment with our organization, a lot of their view and their value of our department as a whole is based off of their relationship and the credibility of that mentor. And then those mentors ultimately go on to make incredible um, you know, shift partners and company officers and, and so on, because they're seeing things from a different perspective. And that's really what mentoring and coaching provides is perspective. Um, and at the end of the day, it's, it's providing an additional layer of personal support. And I, I think that's something that we all personally um, value. And, and one of the benefits to mentoring is, is bridging generational gaps. So when we're talking about bringing on new employees. Um, there's a, there's a basically a concept to engaging millennials. And again, guilty as charged, I am a millennial. So uh, one of those five R's, the last one is actually a, is rapport. So people want to learn from somebody that they believe, and this is why I don't think it's exclusive to millennials, they want to be engaged with somebody who they believe values them, somebody that they believe is connected with them and cares that, that they're going to be successful. And that's why I think if you really remove the word millennial from it, that's something we would probably all want, is somebody to learn from who genuinely cares about what we're doing. And that's what we see in the world of mentoring and coaching. Can I just interject one quick thought? And it, it was an interesting conversation. And Jess, that, Jesse, that's a, it's kind of off the topic here for a second, but I think you guys will enjoy it. I was having an interesting conversation with a friend of mine who waxes poetic from time to time and, and he writes books. And so if you look at age groups instead of like baby boomer, millennial, X gen, or just look at the age that people are, there are certain attitudes, qualities, um, opinions that folks tend to hold at different stages of their life, which is fascinating. So like old guys like me that have less life ahead of them than they have behind them tend to get along really well with people who've got a lot of life ahead of them and very little life behind them. So like very young children, six and seven and 10 and 12 year old kids and, and grandparents like me are like magic, man. It's like, we're at Disneyland and we're digging it all. You know what I mean? And no disrespect to you all, but you, you all in the middle are like a little more serious about this whole thing. And I'm not sure about the messaging of that magic mountain thing. I think we ought to, you know, magic it could be, it could be like sorcery. And so, you know I mean? We like the middle people overthink like everything. It's like really, really fun to watch. And, and they always assume that them coming up under them didn't go to school uphill both ways. And those guys that went before them, well, they were either bloody geniuses or, you know, didn't do it right. So, it, and, and when you get to my point, it's like, yeah, I'm good, you know? And when you're a little guy, you're like, yeah, I'm good. So it's kind of fun to, to watch the folks in the middle. And if you think about it, the fire service is all folks in the middle, 99.5%. We have very few people at the end and we have very few people at the early beginning. Most everybody is that magic 23 to you know, 45. And that's our career span. It's a, it's a 20 year career and, and that's not right or wrong or good or bad. That's just the reality of the physicality of our profession, you know, male or female, you, you know, I'm getting weaker all the time. And at, at, at my age, at this point in time, it's, you, you see it, it's demonstrable. You can year in and year out in your workouts, you notice it. At, at your age, it's, it's much more protracted, right? It's much longer. And, and the younger people are getting stronger. So you've got people right at that cross, that point in their lives where they're hitting their optimal physical and just beginning the downside. It's the middle people, right? And so, you know, we talk about the generations in the fire service, but you know, it's really not as clean cut because the generations, when they do it, um, you know, and they label it, 
I, I just think if you talk about the age, it's easier because then it takes all of that, as, as Jacob mentioned, all the politics is out of it when you just talk about age because everybody ages, you know what I mean? And, and I don't think labels age well, you know what I mean? They just don't. I mean, I'm a boomer and that just means that, you know, when my dad came home from the second world war, he was ready and my mom was ready because the war was over. So we were an explosion of people, you know, and uh, I, I'm not sure what the X and the Y and the, you know, let it go, you know, I, I, I don't know for me, but the other thing I thought was fascinating when you talk about that is putting, like, you could be a great mentor, like, like Demon might be a great mentor for me, but not for Tony. And, and Steve might be perfect for Jacob, but not for Jesse. You know what I mean? And, and it's interesting, you know, it, it, that's where I think Gary Klein kind of has it right with the pattern matching. Sometimes it's just intuition at work, which is a, one of Gary's other books, which is a great book. Um, sometimes it, it, you know, connections are interesting and I don't think they need, I don't think you need to look at people who grew up in the same kind of neighborhood or any of that kind of stuff. Sometimes it's just the ability, like it's just easier to talk to some people for some people and, and, and they might have absolutely zero in common. You know, it could be a, a, a 68 year old black woman and a, you know, 19 year old white kid and, and they have nothing in common. The, the white kid could have been raised in, in Bangor, Maine, and, and, and the African-American lady could have been raised in the, in the deep South, but they connect like that, you know what I mean? And then you might find two guys, both raised in downtown Miami, both, you know, Hispanic, they can't talk to each other. It, it, and it's just how it is. Hey, I see somebody wants to jump on that. Somebody is, 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 is moving in their seats to jump on that. So who's taking it? Well, I'll say a couple of things. First of all, it seems like every time we do this, I got to tell you, I just get more excited as these things progress minute by minute. In this one, holy crap, there's some great wisdom in this hangout. Oh, my gosh. I, I wrote down like a lot of things already from everything everybody was talking about. It's the same thing, Chief. So, but amongst this being a great conversation, I think that you guys have really got something going here. You've definitely hit um, some, some of my heartstrings. Uh, right now, I'm the assistant chief over training, EMS, and special projects. And in special projects includes professional development. So when you mention the word succession planning, I got to tell you, you hit up, you hit a nerve, because I'm, I'm very, I, I consider myself a good succession planner because I've been a victim of maybe not so great succession planning, as many of us have, as most of the fire service is kind of a victim of. I don't mean to be a jerk. I don't mean to talk bad about our fire service, our profession, but we are not good at succession planning. I mean, we're just not. So when we're talking about this, we're talking about the mentoring program that you guys have right here and the potential for it to be part of that greater infrastructure to help us continue to navigate through this. I'm excited about it. It, it, it speaks to me of infrastructure. I think of two words so far. One is the infrastructure I just mentioned. And I think that you got a, something strong here. And you're being intentional about it. That's the other word. You're being intentional about it. You're not just letting it happen. You're not just saying, oh, well, you know, that guy's my mentor because he happened to be there at a time where he offered me some advice and it just happened naturally and I got lucky. No, you're being intentional about it. We're talking about intentionally mentoring, intentionally building the infrastructure for the future. And I think that's a key thing that we got to be cognizant of, that intentionality about not just letting it happen, but having a plan in place. As an administrator, if someone comes in my office with an idea and, hey, I got a great idea, we should do this. That's great. And that's all and they walk out. Well, great. Have a nice day. Bye. I got other things to worry about. But when somebody comes in with a plan, a strategic plan, backed up by data, like you guys are talking about, based on our needs, now we can talk. Now it's exciting. Okay, what's going on? How is this going to build? So I don't mean to go off on a tangent either, but this is exciting stuff. I think that this is, uh, like I said before, something that's not only just maybe an option or something that's nice to have. I think that this is what right, we're talking about right here is necessary and should be part of the future of every fire service department moving forward. Something like this, like the ISFSI is doing a mentoring program that's, again, backed by data, catering to our needs, maximizing the efficiency of our people, passing on that ability of the people that have been here to the newer generation, catering to them almost on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So this is a good conversation. I'm glad, I'm really glad we're having it. Yeah, I want to, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. 
I'm sorry, Chief, just to reemphasize the two eyes you mentioned at infrastructure. Not every organization has the bandwidth to create such a program or initiative. All the more reason why to seek out assistance, that collaboration, that's what, that is one of the things that makes the fire service great is that we are good at collaborating both during peacetime as well as during, you know, on the fire ground or, or in the hazard zone. So, and so using the ISFSI as that infrastructure builder and then also being um, intentional about it. Sam's yeah. two eyes is what keeps us in the um, position that we're in today. Yeah, I just want to add on what Chief, something Chief Shaw said and uh, Chief Halton, when we talk about not worrying about, you know, generations or, you know, race, you know, worrying about all the things that don't matter. What I love about the ISFSI program is that it doesn't do that, right? So it's, it's a specific and an intentional match between a mentor and a protege or a mentor and a mentee whatever you want to say, whatever language you want to say. And the mentor and the pro, uh, protege and mentee fill out skills inventories and needs assessment, and they're matched in that way. And really the only consideration other than, hey, what are your needs? What are your gaps? What do you feel like you want to, uh, you know, really improve on, you know, personally and professionally in the fire service? But I think from a mentor perspective, all it is is someone wanting to leave it better than they found it, right? So someone wants to help someone else out. And then from a mentee perspective, all they're looking for is some is someone to help them leave them better than they found it. So they have a they have a, a, a shared alignment, you know, a shared mission. And the only thing is each one of them wants to help the other get better. You know, so there's none of this other mumbo jumbo in there about where you're from, where you're at. It could be someone in you know, New Zealand and California, California, New York, New York and Texas doesn't matter. And they're only paired because each one wants to help each other and they want to leave the fire service better than they found it. And it's an intentionally matched um, uh, relationship based on what a mentor can provide the mentee uh, based on what they said they need or they'd like to work on in their career. And so I love that. All right. So let's get down to the nitty gritty here. Um, you mentioned earlier, Jesse, about software, a yes. software that's involved in this. Can you talk about that? Yes, I can. So we, um, as a committee, one of the things we've done over the last uh, year plus is evaluate several different software providers, right? Because we want this to be something that is sustainable. And um, a big part of that is the infrastructure as Chief Shaw related to. Um, so after going through that, the, the program that we've settled on is a program called Mentor City. And Mentor City currently uh, facilitates several formal mentoring programs, both in the world of, of academics, as well as in uh, private industry as well. So they bring a wealth of knowledge to the table. They bring a wealth of resources to the table and they, they really um, provide that infrastructure for us to facilitate our objective. And you know, this has been mentioned, professional development in general, the, their onboarding of somebody is just the first step in that professional development model. And I know the ISFSI also just came out with a professional development matrix that kind of provides a little bit of a roadmap. And then using something similar to that, these mentors um, embedded within this site, because it's all fully customizable, can just continuously go back to resources such as that to fill that gap. So in our organization, it becomes more difficult to provide formal mentoring um, with some of the different positions because we have such a limited quantity here within our organization or, or within our bandwidth as uh, Chief Simmons alluded to. So this, this uh, software system, increases that network for us and it, it increases our bandwidth and it allows us to connect with people based off of those critical factors. What are we looking for? So Mentor City is the, the program that we're using and uh, we're in the process of building that out right now. So hopefully that program as a whole can launch um, at the end here of, of the of quarter two. So I got so do we have to be a member of the ISFSI? to really capitalize on this? Yeah, so initially, um, you know, there, there are several, there will continue to be several different articles and uh, training opportunities and so on that are offered, you know, through the ISFSI that can be accessible um, to different people. But overall, the, the best way for us to really um, monitor the program, so to speak, and to ensure the quality is to do it through um, our membership. So there are no additional fees for it. Um, it's really included with the cost of membership, which is a pretty good value at the end of the day. When you think of something that could result in a 
relationship that could last your entire career and, and hopefully longer. And that's where just this committee has kind of served as an incubator for that. Um, with Demond and Jacob and some of the other members on the committee, I feel like uh, the traditional barriers that were there to communication don't exist anymore. And I, I feel, you know, like with Demond and Jacob, I almost know them personally, even though um, we've really only known each other for the last year plus, and, and it's been over video conferencing, but it still leveraging technology provides us with some opportunities today that we didn't have in the past, or we weren't as willing to accept in the past. And I, I think that's also maybe one of the the, the saving graces of this, this pandemic that we're operating in is it has opened us up to doing things a different way. And that's what this whole initiative is about, is, is being innovative and leveraging technology to make something possible that in other, in other ways may not be as possible within our own department. That's awesome that um, you, you guys, I mean, the other committee members, we got New Jersey, we got to, you know, two, you couple of guys in California, you're in, uh, in Michigan, um, and you were able to really get together and, and formulate something on the Zoom thing, right? Um, so as much as this, this has been a pain in the ass for the last year or so, um, we, found, we found some kind of positive in this thing to, to, uh, to, form, to, to move forward with. Uh, Bill Carey asked about the, the mentoring, how much it sounds like what you guys are really going towards is the soft skill stuff. We're, we're not talking about operational stuff. We're talking about um, characters, um, again, um, like building um, morals, um, that kind of stuff, right? The emotional intelligence stuff of getting away from operations and really working, centering it on emotional intelligence things. Yes. Now this is this is Jacob. I, I'll let the other guys speak to this too. I, I think it's it's a like I said, it's a holistic thing. I don't want to get it, you know, separated per se. I think it's both. You know, I think you, you're gonna have someone help you through those other things that maybe you don't talk about a lot in your organization, but there's also someone that maybe has experience in other things. Like for example, in smaller organizations, you know, you might not just have a battalion chief that just does operations, or you might even have a firefighter or a fire captain. That's the health and safety officer that's running the SCBA program that's doing all these things other than just being a firefighter. Um, and so for operationally and even like program management wise, I think it's all encompassed. Uh, honestly, if, if their succession plan says you need to get this stuff and have experience in these things, the department or the district or wherever you work usually only has a finite amount of resources, right? Well, for me, the mentor's job, if, if I'm a mentor is to help them still achieve those things if they don't have the resource or the abilities on the other side of the house. Like I, I'm supposed to point them in a direction where, hey, this is how I accomplished that. This is how I went to that training. This is how I did. So I, I, I think it's supposed to be both. And it's intended to be both. Even in our matching, if someone wants to just be paired with someone who is considered a you know gold star instructor, let's just say a well-known instructor about the fire service, and they want to improve their ability uh, to be the best fire service instructor they can be, you know, that's part of that program as well. It's not just, hey, tell me how to handle these types of personalities or those type of things, or tell me how to help myself recognize, you know, this or that. I think it's a holistic thing. Like I said, we're just talking about, I think, the EI side more now because it's not talked about enough. Um, but the other side comes into play just just as well. I think, I think that uh, that really opens the door too, right? Like if I go to someone for operational help, then that may open the door for them to open up about the other things, the other stuff, how to, how to navigate the other thing. Uh, and this, uh, this framework that you guys have may help with, with that side as well. Yeah, initially that is, oh, go ahead, Damon. Just one, one quick comment, just adding on to that. Oftentimes when we think of mentoring and coaching, we, we associate it with those soft skills. Let's remove soft from the equation and insert it with essential skills. And if we insert essential skills, that would include everything that you just mentioned. Fire ground operations, as well as leadership management behaviors in and around the firehouse. Because at the end of the day, we're, we are in a profession that when the, when, the, when the tones go off, the bell goes off and we have to go respond, we have to perform. We have to engage in psychomotor type activities. And 
it's important that the men and women have those acquire and attain and enhance that um, those skills as well. So look at it as essential skills and not soft skills. I think Damon said that perfectly. And again, that's why I feel uh, so fortunate to be a part of this group because these uh, words of wisdom, such as Damon just shared with us. Um, and, and that's kind of our goal is to allow these technical competencies to be the incubator for these, these other opportunities in terms of personal growth or as the mind referred to them, essential skills. So basically how this works is if somebody's interested in this program, they can sign up. It's it, Think of it as a menu. They select what they'd like to do. And it, it may be something along the lines of, I really would like to teach um, at, a, at a major conference. How do I do that? So that's that coaching piece. And, or they want to, they are a new instructor, they're a training officer, they're a training coordinator, and so on, whatever it may be. We're using um, very objective-based criteria initially to match. So NFPA 1041 is essentially our, our initial menu. So what are those professional qualifications for a fire instructor? And if, if you're looking to grow in a particular area, naturally, once you're matched with somebody who excels in that area or has experience and uh, you know, a, a different level of uh, competence and willingness to share their information, then that begins the, the process. And that is that incubation period of Yes, we're talking about how to deliver a winning presentation, but there's a lot more that goes with that than just having a nice PowerPoint or you know something along those lines. So that is the idea is that all of these things are framed up as the essential skills using these technical competencies, if you will. I think, I think the way you guys said that was really brilliant because um, if you remember Paul Chiller is the South African mathematician and, and philosopher who wrote about postmodernism and dynamic complexity, the fire service as a profession is a dynamically complex profession, right? In other words, and Chillers once had a brilliant quote, he said, in a dynamically complex environment, you can control nothing, but you can influence everything. And so, in other words, to be a good fire ground commander and you want to build a good team, you've got to be a great communicator. You've got to be an empathetic listener. You've got to be a uh, You've got to be a creative um, thinker. And now all of those things are skills that you can work on and, and you can get coaching and counseling on and you can practice and you can get better at and you can borrow Rob. As I like to say, if you if you take from one, it's plagiarism, but if you take from many, it's research. So you can research that. But um, because it's really, you know, n n everything we talk about has been talked about before, literally everything. And so, you know, the chance to talk about it again is important. And the other thing to remember too is that, you know, we talk sometimes about succession planning as if there's a time frame or a schedule. There isn't. It's continuous. It's every day. It's right now. Somebody's walking out the door and that person needs to be replaced. Somebody's moving out of the driver's position and that person needs to be replaced. Somebody's the new assistant chief of that or the deputy chief of this. And so, as they move, that new vacuum's created and that line is constantly moving, that new recruit is coming in. That's the very definition of dyna a dynamically complex organization that operates in dynamically complex environments. And so influencing any little part of it is the best we can hope for and absolutely the most we should strive to complete every single day. If you're gonna try to control it, you're gonna go crazy. You know. Bruno used to say the the whole command staff goes home at five o'clock, and when we come back in the morning, they're still here. So you know, you know that's the that's the magic of the whole system, if you will, right? So I think what you're doing is wonderful, and I think that people are going to come to it with different needs and, and with different uh, you know, and they're going to add to it. Everyone who comes is going to leave something, and 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 everyone who comes is going to take something away, and and they're going to share it. And then someone else is gonna, you know, like twist it just a little bit. You know what I mean? So I love, I love, and the more we communicate, the better because, um, you know, that's really what it's all about. You know, and, and it's interesting. Somebody once said, "It's not what you say; it's how people feel about what you say," which is really interesting when you think about it. And they're right in in terms of certain aspects, but what you say matters. It, it matters. It matters greatly, and you know. And sometimes people will misinterpret your words, and that's fine. You know, you, you, and you can and you can work to get better at your messaging. But 
the answers you just gave, I think were brilliant because mentoring and coaching and, and sharing and all of that, that, that we're talking about isn't ever going to be confined to just, and, and the word soft skills, <clears throat> don't take that word lightly because the, the man who was the, one of the best soft skilled generals of all time was George Patton. George Patton's men would do incredible feats for him because he was George Patton. And that wasn't a guy that was going around hugging everybody. You know, he was a tough, he was a tough cookie. And so, you know, when we say soft skills, I think Damon got it right. We should call them critical skills. You know, um, there's nothing soft about the communication message that, that we have to deliver sometimes. You know, there's nothing soft about you know, having to deliver death notifications or, you know, do triage at some of the calls we go to. There's nothing soft about that. And, and so, you know, I, I love that, that word critical skills and, and, and soft is okay too. There are times when, man, you want to be soft as you possibly can be. You know what I mean? You just, you just want to grab somebody and hug them. I, I can't wait to be able to do that on a broad scale as soon as possible, because I'm a notorious hugger and I, I miss my hugs. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't you guys, I mean, honestly, I mean, don't you miss getting a good old fashioned bear hug? You know, you, you bump into somebody you haven't seen them and you know what I mean? You show up at a conference and it's like, oh, you know, you, you know I love that. You know, other professions walk up, hi, Dan, you know, the lawyers or, or CPAs get together, you know, and they're all, Mostly, you know, firefighters are like, ah, you know, <laughs> that's great. I love it. it, it hey, yeah. All right. Let's, let's get off the hugging thing now. And, um, Steve, uh, Steve, you have, it was, uh, my little, it was my little bit of mentoring. It's a skill. It's a skill I want you to work on Carol. Cause okay. you, you, you're, you're kind of clumsy at it still. Okay. I'll work on that when I see you. How's that? So how does this differing, how does this program differ from other ones that have out there that have been tried. So I, I, I think we touched on this actually a little bit earlier. We talked about the two eyes, you know, one of them being the uh, infrastructure, right? So this is something where we're not trying to, um, it, it's a very formal mentoring program. And, and that infrastructure is a big key behind that. And, and to add another eye in there, innovation, um, we're not reinventing the wheel per se. We're making, we're adapting the wheel to the needs of the fire service through this um, this this program that we're launching here pretty soon, and that is really what makes it unique. Is that this is something designed for us, by us, using what um, what many other people, including the the private sector, already use and. There's so many different interesting statistics associated with mentoring, but 71% of Fortune 500 companies have a formal mentoring program. And it's, it's software providers such as the one that we're using that make that possible for them. So it's, it's harnessing that and putting it in the context of the fire service and taking some of that strain off of the mentor or the protege or, or mentee to find these ways or invent ways to communicate with one another. Everything is done under one umbrella. So it's, it's kind of a one-stop shop to mentoring and coaching and that is is truly unique. Yeah, because that would be the okay. toughest thing. Where like how do you start this? Right. And this has already been done. Uh, this is kind of already we're using examples from other places to bring this to us. So that that's great. Jacob, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna piggyback off what Jesse said. Uh, I, I think uh, just across the fire service wide, including agencies I work for in the past, we've put together mentoring programs, formal mentoring programs, but I've never seen a platform like this. And I think the platform honestly is key because the platform is what uh, matches, right? Matches the people that connects the people. The platform is what tracks progress. The platform is what allows you to meet virtually, right? So it's not a specific Zoom. The platform is what evaluates the progress and, and the outcomes to see if the mentee is getting what they need. Um, we evaluate the mentors uh, based on the, the mentee's feedback and whether they should or should not, you know, be resigned. So I think that that platform just on its head uh, and then you add in all the talented individuals that are taking place um, 
not only through the committee, but through the, in, in a mentoring aspect. And I've never seen anything like it. I mean, honestly, the system does the work with the matching that we do. It helps with the training, it helps with the meetings, it helps with the follow-ups, it helps with the evaluations. And it's just pretty extraordinary. So I think in, in just that way, bringing all that together is, is, is different than at least what I've seen personally. All right. So while this kind of focuses on instructors, right, because it's the ISFSI's program, it's not limited there. We can take it to other parts of your department. So so uh, recruits, um, officers that aren't instructors can can this can work for them as well. Right. Absolutely. It's uh, it. These are our transferable skills, so to speak. Um, this is open to anybody who's a member for this particular program, anybody who's a member of the ISF side, doesn't matter per se which capacity they serve in. The idea is, is really just to uh, support, inspire, and, and motivate people um, through a new program um, that centers on coaching and mentoring. All right, good. Steve, Steve, you have uh, anything you want to fire a question at these guys before we um, wrap this up? Yeah, I don't have a, a question per se, but I think they covered a lot of uh, what we needed to hear in terms of the, the program itself. And I, I definitely appreciate what they've covered. And, and I, like I said, the questions I had have been answered already. I will say this, though, in terms of another I, uh, Chief Alton mentioned that, that word influence. Uh, I think that you guys through the ISFSI, because we're all instructors in some way, shape or form, you know, I think um, you know, leadership is influence, just like um, it has been said. And there's a tremendous amount of influence for those that want to teach. And this is a great way to, to initiate that. But um, like I said, this has been just a great conversation. We've covered so many important topics through this. And um, I'm just really happy to see that it's getting the, the, the press, the light, the limelight it needs, because it is a big ticket item. And I'm glad you guys are really taking this hard step forward. So I'm, I'm really happy that I was able to, to be on today, listening to this. And I'm, I'm Definitely hopeful to see where this goes in the future. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really inspired as a, as a board member for the ISFSI, seeing these three members and others from the committee stepping up and, and really taking this thing on and uh, moving it forward. With that, um, Damon, do you have any, any final words, anything you want to add uh, that we really didn't cover yet or uh, words of wisdom? Yeah, I just want to say out there to the, to the fire service community as a whole, um, and mentoring and coaching, whether it's from an instructor perspective or from a company officer perspective, chief officer perspective, or firefighter perspective is needed. And this is what's going to continue to um, lead us down the road as a, as a um, great profession. And um, it'd be a tremendous benefit to the stakeholders, to the communities that we serve all across the United States and the world for that matter. So once again, thank you for hosting and um, Looking forward to great things coming out of this conversation. Damon, you're um, 25 more years you're going to do, huh? That's good. So Yeah, gold is 50 years. A lot of good stuff coming out of you with uh, within those 25 years. Jesse, Jesse, uh, any, any wrap-up words there? A couple things we missed or nuggets you want to add? Well, I think this is something that uh, Chief McAfee personally excels at, and, and he we just recently had the opportunity to teach a class together, and he ended with some thoughts from the uh, Marine Corps um, doctrine number seven, I believe. So I'll, I'll let him do that. But really, the idea is we think of mentoring a lot of times as an individual type of skill or an individual event, but really the fire service is not built on individual individualism or individuality. It's, it's built on teamwork and on a a global goal to, um, to basically meet the needs of the people that we serve. And a, a big part of the population that we serve are our own members in terms of making sure they have those opportunities to get that support, not only from day one in their career, but all the way through. And, and the unique part about the fire service is our friendships. And the reason why we are so eager to hug people when, they, when we see them, Chief Halton, is because we build those personal connections um, over a long time. And in, in DeMond's case, looks like at least 50 years. So, um, you know, that's the value of the fire service. Mentoring in general is a team concept. It is not an individual concept because we are all moving towards the same goal. So. Come on. That's a lot of hugs, man. 50 years of hugs. Jacob. Uh, <laughs> Jacob, you have that, um, 
that uh, leadership thing that Jesse just talked about? Yeah, I, I don't have it in front of me. I, I'm going to, I'll paraphrase it. Um, but uh, in the mentoring one-on-one program uh, through the ISFSI conference, the vision 2020, uh, the vision conference we just had, that's an on-demand um, video. You can watch that mentoring one-on-one program if it's still available. And that's at the end. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, it was, it was just like Jesse said, it was, it was a paraphrase from Marine Corps publication doctrine seven. And it, it the title of the doctrine is called learning. Uh, and it's, it's the Marine Corps ethos and philosophy on learning. And so I, I found a, a paragraph in there that was geared really towards preparing, uh, you know, soldiers or Marines for combat. Right. And it, at the end of the day, it said, uh, and this is a paraphrase, it, if we're going to prepare our firefighters to be effective on the fire ground, effective in the firehouse, and effective in our professional relationships within our community. Uh, we have to be a student of continuous personal and professional development, and mentoring is one of the keys to that. And I, I will say that um, just to end that it took me years to build a group of mentors, uh, both formal and informal, that really helped me, you know, have opportunities like this, honestly, right, and meet people like Jesse and you and you know, uh, you know, go to conferences and, and just really have that, uh, really mentorship to help me reach out if I have problems and guide me through really tough times or whatever. And this is an accelerated version of that, right? It, you, you have an organization that's saying, Hey, we're invested in you and we're going to pair you with the right person to be the best version of you. So our communities can be safer across the fire service and we can leave it better. We found it. So, uh, let someone do it for you. Right, you know, take advantage of it. Go to the program, check it out, uh, and and you'll see the the level of investment influence that you'll get from this program. Uh, good stuff there. I really really appreciate you guys coming on talking about that. This is all in the the big framework the ISFSI has of of inspiring, supporting, and elevating instructors. Right, but again, it doesn't just stop there. But we do know how valuable our instructors are in the fire service, right? And um, the ISFSI is, is available for, for that. If you, if you want to become a member, there's ways to get to, we can get you membership and you can see some of the things that will open up to you to be able to do that. So really appreciate that. Speaking of that, members, don't forget tonight, five o'clock, happy hour, the uh, ISFSI members happy hour tonight where we will meet the new board for uh, the upcoming couple of years. Uh, you can come with that. Again, that's five o'clock tonight, Eastern time. Chief Halton, uh, any final words? Yeah, I'll see you guys in August. We'll uh, be out in Indianapolis. We're going to be having the very first summer school, FDIC summer school. So uh, it ought to be interesting. And uh, looking forward to the fun run and the stair climb and uh, the comedy night for the Cancer Support Network and, of course, all the great education. So uh, just just thrilled to be back on the road. I'll be up in um, Charlotte, uh, Michigan, which uh, not to be confused with Charlotte, North Carolina, but I'll be in Charlotte, Michigan. I'm not sure how far that is from you, Jesse, but uh, roughly an hour, roughly an hour. Heading, not out that far. Out, heading out that way next week to visit with some of the guys. I'll be in Wichita this weekend. So if anybody's up in Wichita, I'll be up uh, outside of Wichita. I'll be at the Kansas uh, Star Casino. It's the Kansas Chiefs. So I'm looking forward to visiting with the Kansas Chiefs on Friday and Saturday. And uh, then uh, week after that, I'm out in Detroit. So if you're in the, if up in Detroit, I look forward to seeing some, some of my friends in Detroit. And uh, Damon, I always, th I always laugh because I, I whenever, whenever I'm with my good friend Ernie Mitchell, we always laugh about, you know, the Oakland, you know, San Francisco Bay Area, which yeah. is where he cut his teeth, you know, as a young firefighter. And, uh, you know, just a, what a, what a storied, you know, an amazing history in that community, fascinating history in that community. And California fire in general is like, it's like wild, right? To try to wrap your head around all this, how it works. It's, it's almost like when you were talking about DC earlier, you know, Tony, how you have like a, a million police departments within, you know, five square miles. California has got like a million variations on the fire service in one state, right? which is really, really cool. I mean, it's really, really cool. Everything from the most traditional old school departments like yours, Damon, to, you know, these incredible uh, interagency, governmental, quasi-private kind of things that are happening. So it's just a great time to be a firefighter. I'm really looking forward to FDIC, and I really appreciate 
you guys being here. So, um, and remember, how did FDIC start? It was fire instructors, 1928, fire service instructors getting together to try to share best practice and things and exchanging papers. And, uh, you know, and when you think about being born during catastrophe, 1929 wasn't such a good year. And they did fine. It, it kept going. We're still here. So, you know, it's a, a iron sharpens iron, right? And uh, so I think we're going to have a great conference and there's so much to talk about. But thank you all for being here and, and God bless. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Chief.